Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Uh, this is an educational channel. Uh, we look at a lot of uh, theories of everything and take uh, you know in-depth looks and so that you can you know see the whole picture and maybe help you out with your um, paradigm shift, your great awakening, and just your life in general with some holistic uh, viewpoints. And today is our 428th video that we've done on Dewey B. Larson and his reciprocal system of theory. Uh, the reciprocal system is, of theory is a system of theory, meaning that it is a unified and generalized theory of every subject. And if you understand how the system itself works, then you can apply it to any subject. And uh, Larson applied it to uh, mostly the, sci the sciences, uh, which includes economics. And he also applied it to psychology and philosophy and religion. Um, some of his followers applied it further afield to things like um, crypto history, uh, history archaeology, uh, crypto archaeology, uh, conspiracy theories, and uh, other things like that. But um, it all started uh, back in about 1930 when Larson was a young engineer and he had some epiphanies about uh, certain little chemistry pro, uh, problems that he was working on and he recognized that he had uh, kind of stumbled into a principle of a general application and so he uh, corralled his resources and uh, attempted to study up on that and figure out what was going on over the next 25 years. In the late 1950s, he put out his two fundamental postulates about how he believed the universe operated. And from that, he deduced a theoretical universe, step by step, if this, then that, if this, then that, um, and came up with a theoretical universe about um, you know, what the universe would look like if his postulates were correct. And then uh, he wrote several books where he compared his findings, uh, you know, deriving equations for uh, different things, uh, how they stacked up against the legacy scientists' observations in the laboratory, in the observatory, and we're looking at one of those books today that's called Basic Properties of Matter. And this book is on Larson's uh, theory of chemistry. And uh, he derives different uh, equations for the basic properties of matter, such as the interatomic distance, the melting point, the specific heat, and the compressibility. And that's what we're looking at today, chapter four on compressibility. So compressibility is basically, you know, how easy is, is it to compress something that's already in the solid state? Um, I guess you can, uh, liquids are generally non-compressible, but um, a solid can be, um, you know, packed down. Um, certain elements can be, uh, be packed down a lot more than certain other elements. And uh, Larson arrives at equations for these. He had to set the groundwork for this before in these the first three chapters where he established interatomic distance. Uh, this is the distances between atoms in closest packing or in, in a, the solid state. Um, legacy scientists believe that this these are... Um, this interatomic distance is actually the size of atoms. In Larson's viewpoint, um, the uh, interatomic distance is the distance between atoms. And that the atoms, uh, Larson's, one of his early books is actually called The Case 
against the nuclear atom. So Larson believed that the atom was actually uh, not as big as um, legacy science has it, that there was uh, this bonding between the atoms and they were actually very far away from each other. Um, and that the size of the atoms is actually the size of the nucleus that the legacy scientists measured. So the atom didn't have a nucleus. The nucleus was really like the whole atom. Um, I've read all of Larson's books except that one. So um, I'm going to, I'm, uh, I've got it on tap here that I'm going to read uh, that book and kind of understand where he's coming from there. But getting back to his theory, okay, we, we want to start with the uh, fundamental postulates. Larson's reciprocal system, he also calls it the universe of motion because Larson believed that the universe was made out of motion. And uh, many other uh, scientists and philosophers had arrived at that conclusion over the years, but none of them made, uh, you know, any headway or any major headway in developing that theory, uh, maybe for two reasons. The first is that they uh, didn't define motion um, specifically or generally enough. Uh, what Larson says is that, first of all, it, this is not basically the motion that you're uh, envisioning when you think of motion, which is mo mainly a vectorial motion, a motion in a direction. Uh, the car is moving 10 miles an hour north. Uh, that's how you think of motion generally, a magnitude and a direction. But Larson is talking about what he calls a scalar motion. And a scalar motion is a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no specific direction. You can envision this using a balloon uh, that you put dots on with a magic marker. If you blow up the balloon, all of the dots will be moving away from each other. And they will not be moving in any specific direction. Rather, they will be moving in all directions. Every dot will be moving away from every other dot. And in fact, every location on the surface of that balloon will be moving away from every other location. So they're all moving in every direction. So there is no specific direction that you can impute to it. The only way that you get a specific direction is if you uh, arbitrarily assign a reference point. That is, that you decide arbitrarily that one of those points is motionless. Once you do that, then you can start assigning specific directions. Um, this is also true when you suck in the balloon and contract the balloon. Um, all of the dots will be moving toward each other, but in no specific direction. Larson refers to these two phenomena, out, the outward expansion of the balloon as the progression, and the inward movement of the balloon would be analogous to gravitation. Um, now, so that's kind of the first uh, caveat that Larson makes to motion. The second is that he defines motion as the relationship between space and time and notes that there is a generalized reciprocal relationship between space and time. And uh, when he first kind of had that idea, uh, it was a little bit kind of forced on him where he was working on, uh, this is way back, uh, in the 30s, early 30s, where he was uh, working on this scientific problem, chemistry problem, and he had a voice in his head telling him to, why don't you just assume that space and time are reciprocals or that time is the reciprocal of space? And uh, he started arriving at uh, a solution to the problem he was working on. And then he had another voice that told, told him to do it for a different problem, and it worked. And then he, he kind of was like, wow, this is kind of interesting. But, but really, he thought, well, the reciprocal of space, what is that all about? You know, that doesn't make any sense. But when you think about it, you know, again, if you're talking about the car is moving at 15 miles per hour, that's speed. 
Speed is space over time. That is a relationship between space and time. Uh, and if you decide to double the speed, you can then say the car is now moving 30 miles per hour. Or alternatively and equivalently, you can say the car is now moving 15 miles per half hour. So that is a reciprocal relationship. You can either double the space or you could have the time. That's reciprocity. So he's like, oh, well, it works for speed. Now, will it work in a general sense? And he found that it did. Uh, for Larson, all of our scientific phenomena are speed. I mean, are motion. They are all forms of motion. All forms of motion are relationships between space and time, basically fractions with time or space as the numerator and space or time as the denominator. Now, the other uh, couple things that he puts into his uh, first fundamental postulate where he lays it all out uh, are that uh, space and time and motion come in three dimensions, and they also come in discrete units. So when, you talk, when you're talking about uh, fractions with space or time as a numerator and time or space as a denominator, you have to consider that there are multiple dimensions involved. Um, you know, it's not just time over space or space over time. Time over space is energy, space over time is speed, but you know, things like matter, matter is time to the third power over space to the third power. And uh, for the example that we're talking about here, compressibility, pressure is time over space to the fourth power. Um, you can think of compressibility or pressure as either um, energy over volume, so time over space, over space to the third power, or you can also think of it as force per area time over space to the second power is force, and then area is space to the second power. Now, um, the other important aspect here is the discreteness. Time, space, and motion come only in discrete units. They are quantized. You have to have a full unit of space before you have space, and so same with time. Um, so, um, if you don't have a full unit, then you don't have anything. So, uh, in Larson's system, you've got, if you have one unit of space in one unit of time, space over time being speed, you have, uh, what Larson calls unit speed, which is also known as the speed of light. So the speed of light in Larson's system is really the background speed of the universe, or he calls it the progression of the natural reference system, uh, the ether, the origin, the zero point, um, the null point, the neutral point. So uh, this is Larson zero. He makes his measurements from the speed of light outward in all directions. This is omnipresent and ubiquitous and eternal. It's always existing in an empty universe. So in Larson's universe of motion, you have to be able to conceive of uh, motion before you conceive of anything moving. Motion precedes the thing that's moving. And actually motion consists, uh, motion, motion comprises the thing that's moving. Um, for thousands of years, we've thought of the universe as being um, a um, drama that is occurring uh, in the background of space and time, that we are uh, going through our paces in, uh, on a stage of space, and it is unfolding through time. But in Larson's universe, the universe itself is composed of space and time. It's not the, space and time is not the container of the universe, but it is the contents of the universe. Now, um, so we've got this progression of the natural reference system as the neutral point. 
That means half of the universe is moving faster than the speed of light, which goes way beyond the scientist's um, you know, comfort zone. And then we, half the universe is moving slower than the speed of time, which is the half that we are accustomed to. We, as physical beings, are, as material beings, are anchored to the spatial reference frame, this three dimensions of space moving through time the, the uh, kind of the container viewpoint. Larson calls that coordinate space and clock time. We are in a three-dimensional still frame um, of space, and we are moving through time here in the, what Larson calls the material sector, the slower than speed of light sector. But if we cross that unit speed boundary and moved into the cosmic sector, we would experience three dimensions of time in a still frame, what he calls coordinate time, uh, and clock space. Uh, space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. A scalar motion of space, uh, just like on the surface of an expanding balloon. So coordinate space is like vectorial. Clock space, clock time is a scalar motion. And they... Uh, kind of are coupled uh, to one another uh, in these um, different sectors of the universe, the material and cosmic sectors. Now, within the cosmic sector and within the material sector, there are, there are sub-regions that have to do with the discrete unit postulate as well. Uh, within the material sector, uh, we have what is called the time region. And the time region is the region of interaction in less than one unit of space. If you don't have a full unit of space, you don't have space. And so you have to have time because the universe is composed of space and time. So uh, if the atoms or molecules are interacting in less than one unit of space, they're interacting in what Larson calls the time region. And when you cross that boundary, that unit space boundary, into the cosmic sector, again, the rules change and the progression is now inward in space and gravitation is outward in space. Now, again, we are anchored to the spatial reference system. So we only see space, we don't see time. And so what Larson does is he uses an expedient, even though the activity is occurring in time, we see it as its inverse in space. He calls it the equivalent space. Um, and there are, there's an equation that he uses to make that translation. So uh, things that are going on in the time region are unobservable until we convert it into equivalent space. Same thing is true, but in the opposite, uh, uh, you know, in time instead of space, in the cosmic sector, in less than one unit of time, you have what he calls the space region. And so the, um, the time region and the space region are subregions of the cosmic sector and the material sector, respectively. And that um, these are the realm of atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules are, are basically a three-number combination of rotations in Larson's system. They start with two photons at the core, uh, which are simple harmonic motions, uh, which there is some dispute about where they come from, which we have talked about a little bit, but we'll talk about in much more detail later. And um, these wave-like um, motions are uh, carried by the progression. That's why they always move at the speed of light. Um, but when they start getting rotated back uh, in an inward scalar direction, then uh, they have to be rotated back in three dimensions. Uh, but after being rotated back in three dimensions, then they begin to gravitate and they begin to move inward uh, on this expanding balloon.
and that is how atoms form. So Larson uses a three number configuration instead of the uh, you know uh, atomic number of the periodic table. Okay, hopefully that's enough background to start getting into this chapter. I'm sure he'll get into some other stuff that we haven't talked about, but um, you know, uh, just have to say again, though, even though this sounds very complicated, um, Larson's system is much simpler than legacy sciences because it's a unified. You know, if you if you learn this for chemistry, you can apply it for uh, astronomy. You can apply it for physics. You can apply it for economics. You know, once you learn how to manipulate the system, then it applies to every subject. So you don't have to learn a whole new set of rules for every other subject. Okay, chapter four, compressibility. One of the simplest physical phenomena is compression. The response of the time region equilibrium Okay, the time region equilibrium, that's the interatomic distance. That is where gravitation, which is outward in uh, equivalent space, and the progression, which is inward, where they are equal. That is where the interatomic distance is. Uh, that's where the equilibrium position is. So compression is plus or uh, really, uh, it shrinks this time region equilibrium. Compression, the response of the time region equilibrium to external forces oppressed upon, impressed upon it. With the benefit of the information developed earlier, we are now in a position to begin an examination of the compression of solids, disregarding for the present question of the origin of the external forces. For this purpose, we introduce the concept of pressure which is defined as force per unit area. In many cases, it will uh, be convenient to deal with pressure on a volume basis rather than on an area basis. We therefore multiply both force and area by distance, which gives us the alternative equation um, E over V. In the region outside that distance, where the atoms or molecules of matter are independent, the total energy of an aggregate can thus be expressed in terms of pressure and volume as E equals P times V. As we will find in the next chapter when we begin consideration of thermal motion, a condition of constant temperature is a condition of constant energy, other things being equal. Equation uh, three there thus tells us that for an aggregate in which the cohesive forces between, um, between the atoms or molecules are negligible, uh, that is an ideal gas, the volume at constant temperature is inversely proportional to the pressure. This is Boyle's law, uh, one of the well-established relations of physics. For application to the time region in which the solid equilibrium is located. The, now basically, the states of matter are established on uh, the time region. So a solid is in the time region in three dimensions, in all three dimensions. Um, a liquid is in the time region in only two of the, its three dimensions. And a gas, a really a vapor, is a um, is a solid is in the time region in just one dimension, and a gas is completely outside of the time region in the, you know, in the time, in the uh, material sector, what Larson calls the time-space region, but what he probably should have called the space-time region. 
uh, again, Larson has to come up with the nomenclature, and it doesn't always work out perfectly. Okay, for application to the time region in which the solid equilibrium is located, the second power of the volume must be substituted for the first power. In the time region, we our relationships are based on the second power, not the first power, in accordance with the general interregional relation previously established. The time region equivalent of Boyle's law is therefore pressure times volume of squared equals a constant. In terms of volume, this becomes volume equals a constant over the square root of the pressure. This equation tells us that at constant temperature, the volume of a solid is inversely proportional to the square root of the pressure. The pressure represented by the symbol P in this equation is, of course, the total, of, the total effective pressure. That is, the pressure equivalent of all of the forces acting in opposition to the rotational forces of the atom. The rotational forces are moving outward in equivalent space. The pressure is acting in opposition to that. The force due to the progression of the natural reference system opposes the rotational forces. So the progression is also contributing to the pressure. Or it says, and acts in parallel with the external compressive forces. But it has the same magnitude regardless of whether or not any such external forces are present. Okay, remember the progression is constant. Outward at the speed of light in all directions. And then inward in the time region. Uh, but at a constant. Whereas gravitation, uh, or what he calls the rotational forces, are variable depending upon this in inverse square law. It therefore exists, uh, exerts, this is the progression. The progression therefore exerts what we may call an internal pressure, an already existing, again the progression is already existing, exists before the universe um, in an empty universe. So an internal pressure, an already existing level of pressure to which an external pressure becomes an addition. In order to conform to established usage and to avoid confusion, the symbol P will hereafter refer to the external pressure only. The total pressure being expressed as P sub zero. Um, so the, the total pressure is P sub zero plus P. On this basis, uh, the equation five above, uh, can be restated as the volume equals a constant, constant temperature over the square root of the sum of P sub zero plus P. The internal pressure plus the external pressure, the square root of, the, of that quantity is the denominator and a constant is the numerator and that equals the volume. Compression is normally expressed in terms of relative uh, rather than absolute volumes. The reference volume being the volume at zero external pressure, where equation 4, 6 has the form, that equation that we just looked at, has the form um, the volume equals um, the constant temperature over the initial pressure, the square root of the initial pressure. 
Okay, so compression is normally expressed in terms of relative rather than absolute volumes. So the re this is the reference volume. The reference volume being the volume at zero external pressure. Dividing the equation, uh, equation six by equation seven and rearranging, we obtain volume over the initial volume equals the square root of the initial pressure over the square root of the sum of the initial pressure and the external pressure. Okay. I probably took me 20 times reading that to understand it over the course of the years. Uh, I think I understand what he's talking about at this point. I'm not so good at algebra, and so uh, I, I've i gotten lost uh, in that many, many times. But it actually does make sense, and I kind of get what he's talking about at this point. So you might want to try listening to that again if you if you got stuck. He only just you know, hit us with eight equations right there. Uh, as this equation brings out, the internal pressure, P sub zero, is the key factor in the compression of solids. Okay, so, you know, in spite of looking at this external pressure for this chapter, really the internal pressure is, is where most of the pressure is applied. Inasmuch as this pressure is a result of the progression of the natural reference system, which in the time region is carrying the atoms inward in opposition to their rotational forces, or gravitation, the inward force acts only on two dimensions, an area, and the magnitude of the pressure therefore depends on the orientation of the atom with respect to the line of the progression. Since the progression is carrying atoms inward in opposition to their rotational forces, that, for some reason, that means that it's only, only in two dimensions. Not sure that I get that quite yet. But, again, you just got to keep going. But, instead of keeping going, we're going to stop right there. And we'll start with this paragraph again tomorrow and see if we can make heads or tails of it then. Um, and uh, hang in there. Just keep going. We're going to get this.